On behalf of the Legislative Issues and Public Affairs Committee, I would like to say good afternoon and welcome to our Public Issues Forum. At this time, it is my honor to introduce you to the members of my committee that are present here today. As I say your name, please stand. Linda Jackson Barnes, Winston Salem, North Carolina Chapter. Attorney Stacy Cole Bell, Dogwood, Georgia Chapter. Attorney Marva Joe Camp, Metropolitan DC Chapter. Attorney Yolanda Cash Jackson, Greater Miami, Florida Chapter. Attorney Cheryl Gray Evans, Newport News, Virginia Chapter. Attorney Claudia McKinnon, Capital City, DC Chapter. Attorney Kimberly Tignor, Prince George, Maryland Chapter. Attorney Donna Wilson, Jackson County, Missouri Chapter. And I am Pamela Means, St. Louis Chapter, Chair of the Legislation and Issues Committee. With the Senate set to take its next vote next week, as it tries to repeal but not replace the Affordable Care Act. And with victims in our community experiencing health care disparities, the African American community finds itself in the midst of a medical emergency. The infant mortality rate in the African American population is twice that of whites. African American men are seven times more likely than white men to receive a diagnosis of HIV and more than twice as likely to die from prostate cancer. Faced with these devastating statistics, there is only one logical question that comes to mind. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> African American women have nearly doubled the obesity rate of white women and are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer. And the African American people experience higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, and stroke. Again, is there a doctor in the house? Historically, many have attributed these health disparities to poverty, poor access to medical care, and unhealthy lifestyles. While most appropriate, these causes are not the end of why we see these disparities. Led by our president, we invite you today to look at one of the less obvious factors that is contributing to healthcare disparities, the decline of African Americans in the medical profession. In 2012, African Americans made up only 4% of the practicing field, 6% of trainees in the graduate medical education and 7% of medical school graduates. In 2014, only 5.5% of physicians and surgeons identified themselves as African American. And out of over 85,000 medical students, only about 5,000 identified themselves as African Americans. While African Americans tend to be less trusting and understandable of doctors and their medical advice, studies have shown that they feel more comfortable with African-American doctors and are more likely to seek out their care. More importantly, African-American doctors are more likely to practice in high poverty areas. Accordingly, the need to increase the numbers, to bring more doctors in the house becomes a state of emergency. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you someone who is committed to building a healthy legacy, a prescription for our future. She is the 16th National President of Lynx Incorporated and the Lynx Foundation. She is the first medical uh, medical doctor and Californian to serve in this role. She is board certified, and she is without question one of the most fiercest sisters I have ever met. It is my pleasure and my honor to introduce you to my
Thank you so much, Pam, for that very generous, please be seated for that very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we have, um, I believe that Pam has set the stage for the value proposition of why we're having this conversation today. As the national president of the Lynx Incorporated, it has been my desire and interest to really try to make sure that we put health uh, at the forefront of everything that we do, because without your health, you have really nothing. We can't do the work that we do in the community if we're not healthy. We can't run up and down these hallways and up and down these steps to this Congressional Black Caucus event if we can't get around. And so it's important that we focus on that. And then I don't know about you, but my real concern about this, as I get older and older, I want somebody taking care of me that looks like me. It matters to me that it looks like me. I seek out doctors of color, and some of us do that. Uh, you know, there's a story uh, with the doctors that we say that um, some of our patients like to seek us out when they have we used to call it the clap, but they would go to the other doctor when they had the medical malpractice case in the motor vehicle accident because some kind of way they thought their ice was colder than ours, but it really isn't. And so today, we're here today because there is an emergency and we want you to help us be able to come up with some solutions. For those of you that may not be familiar with the Lynx Incorporated, we are an international non-for-profit organization that has been around for over 70 years. We have 283 chapters in 41 states, the District of Columbia and the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, and our focus is on friendship and service. I'm going to dispense with a lot of um, scripted uh, information today because I really want to get to the meat of the presentation, and that's right here with this great group of panelists that we have this afternoon. But as I've indicated, I think it is very important that we focus on this, and you've heard why. Um, you know, you can't do things like this without a group of individuals that are really willing to work hard. And at this time, I want to stop and applaud the Legislative Issues and Public Affairs Committee led under the dynamic leadership of Pamela Means from the St. Louis chapter of Missouri. And then the team members. Um, I also want to extend a very warm appreciation to Congressman Cedric Richmond. Because, you know, those of us that are in the link, see, we're not in Congress. I'm going to tell you the stories. You can't get these rooms and these facilities unless you know somebody. And you have to have a connection to do it. So you may have the desire or the love, but unless somebody's willing to give up their space to you, it doesn't happen. And so we want to acknowledge and applaud Congressman Cedric Richmond. And we have a special award for Congressman Richmond. Has he arrived yet? Well, we will flex the program for him. Ladies and gentlemen, you will understand that when he comes in, we're going to meet his schedule. The other person that we have a special award for today, and she is not able to be here, is our Senator Kamala Harris. And if you don't know who she is, then let me tell you a little bit about Kamala. She's a lifelong public safety and civil rights leader. United States Senator Kamala Harris was the first African American and the first woman to serve as Attorney General of California and the second African American to be elected to the United States Senate in history. Throughout her career as a prosecutor, Harris was a tireless advocate for the most voiceless and vulnerable Californians. As she, we used to call her when she was uh, the big DA, the top cop, and she probably says that a lot on a lot of her posts and so forth, but Harris has worked intensely to protect children and students. She established California's Bureau of Children's Justice and fought to reduce elementary school truancy so that every California child can exercise his or her constitutional right to an education. As Attorney General, Harris successfully sued predatory for-profit colleges scamming students and veterans. Throughout her career, Harris has been a leading advocate for innovation and reform in the criminal justice system. Harris worked to increase the adoption of technology and data-driven policing to assist law enforcement in the efficient investigation and prosecution of crime, established the first office of recidivism reduction and reentry, and pioneered the nation's first open data initiative to expose racial disparities in the criminal justice system. She is born and raised in Oakland, California. I'm so proud that she is my senator. Harris is a graduate of Howard University right here in Washington, D.C., and I know those Howard alums are very proud of her as well. And she is a graduate of Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. Um, we did get word that Senator Harris is not able to be with us today, uh, but we uh, 
award this to her uh, in uh, her absence and um, just ask that when you see her, please thank her for the great work that she is doing. And I will see her tomorrow and I'll be slipping her her award at another luncheon where she will be present and, um, and awarded. So let me move on uh, with our program today. We have a group of very distinguished ladies and gentlemen as part of this panel. And I will start with our moderator. Some of you who have attended our um, forums before may be familiar with this young lady. She is, I have to say, she is, she is my mentor. I remember uh, Dr. Penn as a young student at Tufts University undergrad, and she was the dynamic pathology professor at the Tufts Medical School. And I used to watch her walk across that stage, and she held court. Uh, and took no prisoners, and I looked and said, ooh, I want to be like that doctor. Um, I remember a friend uh, had a uh, son that said he was going into pathology, and I learned that he was going to be working under Dr. Penn, and I said, well, he better get himself together, because she does not take any mess. She's serious, and then she went on to, um, to go to Howard University and be a part of the chair of that pathology department, and then she went on, and I watched her there uh, become one of our first presidents of the National Medical Association, and I've continued to admire her over the years. And then let me also say that within the last seven days, at the University of Virginia, in case you didn't know, it's hot off the press, they have named the medical school after Dr. Vivian Penn. So it is Penn, Vivian Penn, Hall School of Medicine. You will hear more from Dr. Penn later. Our next panelist is um, actually uh, one of the members of our executive council for the Lynx Incorporated. She serves in the role of Director of Health and Human Services. So those of you that may not be familiar with our organization, we have five areas of focus. One of them is Health and Human Services. She's the top doc for the Lynx Incorporated, and she runs all of our medical uh, programs. She's small but mighty. She's probably dripping wet, about 98 pounds maybe. But she, when she is not here, because she has to catch a plane back tonight, she's on the front line, ladies, in Oakland, works in a county hospital as an emergency physician. So if you get into a gunshot mode, stab, that's who's going to be taking care of you. Her name is Dr. Jocelyn Freeman Garrick. And she is a graduate of UC Berkeley, attended the University of, Me of um, Southern California for medical school, trained in emergency medicine, and she is on this panel representing the fact that she is the founder and president of Mentoring in Medicine and Science. Thank you, Jocelyn, for being here. Our next panelist, um, we are so pleased that she uh, was able to be here with us. We actually just learned this week that Dr. Mallet was going to be in our community. And so we, when we found out, we were thrilled and said we'd love to have her to be part of this team. And so she is the Senior Vice President of Health Affairs and Dean for the School of Medicine at Meharry Medical College. In her role as Senior Vice President for Health Affairs, she is responsible for the quality of health care provided at Meharry and for the maintenance of health service affiliations that help the college provide exemplary training for its students, residents, and fellows. She obtained her bachelor's degree in biology from Bardard University and received her MD from Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. She also holds a master's degree in medical management from Carnegie Mellon University, and she is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive pelvic surgery and has authored nearly 100 articles, book chapters, and abstracts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mann. Our next panelist is the Dean of Howard's College of Medicine and Vice President of Clinical Affairs for Howard University. Dr. Mighty, Dr. Hugh Mighty. Dr. Mighty oversees the College of Medicine's academic programs and provides oversight for the administrative and financial operation of the College of Medicine. Mighty will also serve as Vice President of Clinical Affairs, having oversight of the relationship between the academic enterprise and the hospital and the responsibility for the development and direction of the faculty practice plan. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from Georgetown University and his medical degree from the University of Maryland and his MBA from Loyola University in Baltimore. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mighty. on the panel, let me 
let me acknowledge that we have, uh, these are all actually, uh, well, link, link Vivian, we've got a link on the end, Dr. Penn is a link, and we've got Jocelyn is a link, and Veronica is a link, and Valerie is a link. Uh, so applaud my link sisters. And so we were just really delighted when we found out that our next panelist was gonna be able to be here. If you don't know who she is, you need to know who she is, because she is the top head, you know what they call that, at the Morehouse School of Medicine. She is president and dean of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice provides a valuable combination of experience at the highest level of patient care and medical research, as well as organizational management and public health policy. Dr. Rice has received numerous accolades, including the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Women of Impact, Women of Achievement, Atlanta, American Medical Women's Association, Elizabeth Blackwell Medal, and Working Mother Media Multicultural Women's Legacy. She is a native of Georgia. Dr. Montgomery Rice holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Georgia Institute of Technology and her medical degree from Harvard Medical School. She completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Emory University School of Medicine and her fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Putzel Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel today. chance to meet him uh, when we were at a fundraiser on the island this summer. Uh, Congressman Cedric Richmond represents Louisiana's 2nd Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. Congressman Richmond currently serves on the House Committee on Homeland Security and the House Committee on the Judiciary. Outside of committee service, he is an active member and chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus and a member of the New Democratic Coalition. As a member of the Committee on Homeland Security, Congressman Richmond works to ensure New Orleans and surrounding communities are adequately prepared for any emergency through oversight of the FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Association. He also works to ensure the security of the nation's critical infrastructure, borders, and ports. As a member of the Committee on the Judiciary, the second oldest standing committee in Congress, Congressman Richmond works with the committee members to exercise oversight responsibility for the United States Department of Justice and Homeland Security. Born and raised in New Orleans, Congressman Richmond is a strong believer in the value of mentorship in his hometown. He is a graduate of the Benjamin Franklin High School, earned his undergraduate degree from the house. Any people from the house in the room? Okay in Atlanta, Georgia, and his Jewish doctorate from Tulane University School of Law in New Orleans. Congressman Richmond is a graduate of the Harvard University Executive Education Program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Congressman Richmond, we are, we are sincerely grateful to you for your willingness to extend opportunities to us in the Lynx Incorporated to be able to have a place. You know, you, we know what it's like to be displaced. You know, you don't have a place to go. So as Lynx, we've got to learn to get connected up so that when we want to do these things, that we have a place. And we needed a place. And Congressman Richmond answered the call without reservation. And we want to thank him so much. So would you please come forward and have a small token? On behalf of our 14,000 members in 283 chapters, we present you with this recognition of profound appreciation from the Lynx Incorporated, and we thank you so much for all of your service. You know, I'm not really crazy, I just kind of look this way. But when I got the call that said the Lynx were looking for a room, and I said, wait, all those black women are looking for a room. Oh yeah, we got that. So uh, let, let me just thank you all really for what you do and uh, thank Glenda uh, for the work that uh, you all do in the leadership and the rest of the executive board. And let me make sure that I acknowledge 
one of my former slave driving bosses, Cheryl, Cheryl Gray. The first law firm I actually worked at, and um, I don't think I was fired from there, but you know, <laughs> who knows? Uh, but she comes from a remarkable family of public servants. Her father's a city councilman, and my mother's a juvenile court judge, where we see all of the impacts of the ills in society, and especially um, the disproportionate effect that it has on African Americans, and especially African American uh, children. It's no secret I represent the second district of Louisiana, which includes New Orleans, but actually goes all the way up the river to Southern University in Baton Rouge. So uh, it's 131 miles, largely African American. But in that district, I have a number of links chapters that do some very remarkable things, whether it's the thousands of pounds of food that they deliver to the food bank, whether it is the sponsoring of the Scripps National Spelling Bee, or whether it's the mentoring of teenage girls at St. Mark's Community Center, they do some amazing things. And when you start talking about just those chapters in New Orleans, and then you multiply that by the 14,000 members, you understand the reach that is really there. So before I close, let me just acknowledge and talk about the members of the Congressional Black Caucus that are your sister links. And I'll start with Rep. Annie Bernice Johnson, who is just one of the most magnificent classes, one of the that I know represents the Dallas area in Texas. Second is Rep. Sheila Jackson Lee, who I was a little tardy because I was covering her form because she's caught up on TV still advocating for uh, victims of Hurricane Harvey. And as a survivor of Katrina and Rita, I understand how important it is to keep making your case when you see the pain and the hurt and the suffering that's going on. So, what? Let me just say one thing about she. She is absolutely one of the strongest people I've ever met in my life. Not one of the strongest women, but one of the strongest persons I've ever met. She didn't miss a boat. She didn't miss floor time, all while undergoing treatment for cancer. She was getting treatment at night and working her butt off during the day. And I don't know many men or women that could do that. And she did it so remarkably, we didn't know what was going on uh, to the very end. And then the others are, of course, our Rep. Marshall Fudge of Ohio, who is a former national president of Delta Sigma Theta, also, uh, who also chaired the Democratic Convention this year. And I don't know if you all had a chance to see her, but she started the convention off with booze and protests, and she said, wait, y'all don't know me. <laughs> and the crowd quickly got in place, and only a link could do something like that. <laughs> then we have Frederica Wilson of Florida, who came in with was a very wonderful uh, advocate, and she has done a lot on the missing Boko Haram uh, young ladies. And we're down to only now 100, and I think 21 being missing. So we're making great headway. Joyce Beatty uh, of Ohio, who is co-chair of our Financial Literacy Caucus, and an outstanding woman, former educated business owner. And then the last but not the least is our newest member. Uh, Representative Val Demings from Florida, who don't know Val, just know that she was paid to carry a gun <laughs> and handcuffs and to lock people up. And she did it uh, in a very uh, impactful manner. But she's one of the leading voices on that can't, you can have a great relationship between law enforcement and the communities that they represent. Those communities need law enforcement, the law enforcement needs those communities. And it should be a no Brain. But for too many young African American males, if they're doing the right thing, their peers look at them as sellouts. But the police still look at them as thugs. So they're really in a no win situation because they're catching it from both sides. So, with that, let me stop and just thank the links for everything you do. And as you talk about healthcare, uh, it is vitally, vitally important. It affects everything um, in the economy. But let me just raise this call to you. The Republicans have until September 30th to pass a replacement for health care reform. They have to do it uh, for one reason. They can't do tax reform without doing health care reform because they're stealing $700 billion out of the health care uh, system so that they can pay for the tax breaks to the top 1%. So we need to make sure that we raise along with all of 
our 14,000 links and all the other organizations out there so that people understand that this is really just a money grant. It has nothing to do with health care. It is out of all the bills that they have introduced and voted on, this is the worst. But they just have to pass something so that they can steal $700 billion and continue to wreck the country. But they're not talking about how it affects the lives of everyday people who are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to raise a family. So with that, let me again thank you and recognize Judge Gray, who I just talked about. Thank you for, uh, for being here, and thank you for letting your husband hire me when I didn't have a job. So thank you all, and have a good time. Thank you, Congressman Richmond. We're going to get on with the program. I'm going to ask everybody that has a seat next to them, kind of like church, put your finger up. And uh, there are no more reserved seats. Anybody that didn't get it from the council, they're going to have to stand up. I'm sorry. You can blame me later. Um, but I do need to recognize my council members that are here. Uh, we have our national vice president that is here, Kim Jeffries Leonard. Please stand. We have our national secretary, Crystal Kendrick, and our national treasurer, Carolyn Lewis. And we also, yes, thank you. Uh, are there also members of the Executive Council that are here? Please stand. Dee Banks Bright, Chair of Hep, Hep CHIV, Pamela Means, Chair of Legislative Issues and Public Affairs. I saw Patricia Bush, who is our Chair of Strategic Planning, and I think that's all for now, but I do want to also recognize one of our past national presidents that is here, coming from the great state of Florida, Regina Jolivet Frazier. At this time, I would like to turn the program over to our distinguished moderator, Dr. Vivian Pink. Thank you. What a distinguished panel we have, and we're happy that we have one gentleman to join the ladies on the stage, because we really want to talk about health care and the care of women and men in the health care system. And there's so many things that we need to address and that we hope you will help us address. We're going to, we're going to proceed with this uh, forum in the following manner. With the experts that we have here, oh, but let me stop first and thank our national president who has brought her expertise and her many years of dedication to medicine and health care to bring forward this particular forum dwelling on health care. And if you look at the news and even if you don't look at the news, you cannot miss how important paying attention to what's happening to health care in this country is today. So thank you so much for bringing this before us. I want to that first. And then point out that we're going to turn to our panel. Now I think each of us could give an hour speech on this topic coming from many different perspectives because I know it's something that has been dear to me for many years, but each of your panelists are all experts coming from different perspectives, probably similar thoughts, but approaching the issues and the problems in different ways. So we are gonna ask each of our panelists to speak for just a few minutes about some aspect of the issues that we are addressing today. Is there a doctor in the house looking at some of the roadblocks why do we see so few, uh, why have we not seen progress in terms of beginning to even reach parity for our uh, African American women and men in medicine, knowing that while I've many, many years spent uh, time dwelling on increasing women in medicine, and just look at how we're represented today, there are more women here on this panel who are physicians than there were in my medical school class, where I was the only one, and now we have five of you on the table. But at the same time, knowing that we've fought many years to get women into medicine, that we have not seen the same thing happen for our black men. And that is, in fact, many of us feel that that is sort of a crisis in medical education and in the delivery of health care. But I'm going to leave it to the experts to address that. So we're going to ask each of them to just speak for maybe five minutes on the topic, the aspect you'd like to address. And then we'll perhaps have a discussion. As I look at the audience, I see experts, I see deans, I see vice presidents. I want to have an opportunity to hear from you and for you to have an interchange with the members of our panel. So it's not just a panel speaking to you, but a true discussion. I think that's what our president wants us to have. Um, in addition, um, I want you to keep in mind when we think about these issues, that we've been involved in trying to increase not only those who are like us, who deliver health care to our 
our people and to other people in our communities, but also knowing the impact that can have on health care. This is not a new concept. Back in 1984, Stephen Keith published an article when we were trying to convince medical schools other than our minority medical schools, HBCU medical schools, and the argument was that if you take in more people of color, and at that time it was primarily those who were African American or blacks, as we were called back then, uh, that, uh, uh, that they would return to their communities to serve. And then you have the report, the Heckler Report, which I like to call the Tom Malone Report, because Tom Malone really wrote that report with Secretary Heckler on, on blacks and excess uh, deaths but also making the point in there, which Herb Dickens told me he actually had written into that report, uh, which indicated that there was a better response to physicians who were of similar background and similar culture in overcoming health disparities, and now many of the issues we're facing today. So I want you to keep in mind what we're working towards, thinking and keeping in mind the ultimate thing, which I think we all want to do in healthcare, which is to overcome health disparities preserve health, it's not just curing diseases, but preserving health and preventing diseases that we need to think about. And so that's the point, that's hopefully the major discussion. And I want you to keep in mind as we end this discussion today, thinking about what we as an organization, or we as a people, or each of us as individuals can do to bring about change in institutional traditions, organization or governmental processes or expectations of our youth or of our consumers of health care that can bring about positive change for the three topics our president has asked us to address. That is the roadblocks, the waiting room meaning the impact on access to health care and bringing about more cures in sight to both cure diseases but also prevent them. And I'll add one further comment, and then I'm going to turn to our panelists. And that is, within the last six months, you know, we have learned a new definition of the term access. I must say, I finished, I just had my 50th, anniversary, 50th class reunion, finished medical school 50 years ago. You can count up the years what that means, but anyway. <laughs> uh, but I finished medical school 50 years ago. And over the last, I'd say, 49 and a half years, one of the main things I've talked about, and I think we've all talked about, is access to health care. But within the last few months, we have learned that access does not always mean access. So I'm going to ask you, when we think about access, the waiting room, the impact on access to health care, to think about the various ways we have to think about and dwell on what access means, and that can be thought of both in terms of both in terms of getting into careers in medicine and healthcare, getting adequate healthcare, and getting state-of-the-art care. I want to just add one more thing. Um, Linda and I had a conversation about this. We have people in this room who are representing other fields of healthcare: nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, allied health fields, uh, and we know that that. We're not addressing all of those specifically today, but many of the principles that we will be discussing, if not all of them, are applicable to other fields of healthcare. So we don't want anyone in another field of healthcare to think we're overlooking them just to focus on medicine. But medicine is our topic to give us uh, give us a basis or a foundation for the discussion today. We agree on that, right? Just to <laughs> let you know, we're not overlooking anybody here. And now I'm going to stop talking because this is such a topic I think and probably every one of you in the audience could speak to that also. So we're going to start with Jocelyn Garrett, Dr. Jocelyn Garrett, uh, and I'm going to ask her to, to comment on, if we know she runs a mentoring and medicine program, which is important, but any aspect of the whole issue of, of health care uh, or access to health careers that you'd like to. Dr. Garrett. Okay, thank you, Dr. Penn. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming to this session. Um, I am always struck by Dr. Penn. I was sharing with her that the first um, fellowship award I received was when I was a medical student 20 years ago, and Dr. Penn, our shero in um, medicine for most African American physicians, uh, leveraged her resources through the NIH and the NMA to create a fellowship to expose medical students to research careers. And, 
Um, so she helped me get that um, award. Um, nevertheless, I was struck by what she said. I was struck by what she said about all of the, the women on the panel now, which can help me start the conversation. I had the opportunity to serve on faculty at UC San Francisco School of Medicine, um, not uh, our beloved HBCUs, but a competitive medical school on the West Coast. I also interview um, applicants who are in medical school who want to match at my emergency medicine residency program, and uh, most of them are women. Uh, the tides have changed. Pam Meads and her staff did a fabulous job providing research for some of you and documented data that shows about 50 years ago, most of the African-American students were men. Um, and now, for the last 10 years, most of them are women. Three quarters of the applicants and current students in medical school are women. So when I'm interviewing, I see women fabulous. I'm a woman, I love women, but I'm the mother of three sons and I would like to see some boys who enter the medical profession as well. And we know that it impacts their care. So one, uh, that gets to the pipeline. The, when the men are not applying to medical school in the same numbers. Where are the boys? Uh, the boys, if they are in a, a resource school, um, that exposes them to health careers will continue on to college and if they get the right mentorship then they may continue on. So I call it the five M's. One of the men, M's is men. Um, the boys, as a mother of a teenager, a tweenager, um, and a nine-year-old, my boys are boy boys playing a ball. And um, I'm always fascinated because I'm struck with all of these, th these issues, and then I see these boys playing football and basketball, um, and they're playing baseball and soccer, and where are we advocating health careers to them and partnering with the coaches lower down in the pipeline? Um, college is too late. We're losing a lot of them before college. We have to expose them to health careers at a younger age. The links, our other national organizations, our lobbyists and legislators who are in the room, we need more funding to support pipeline programs, to support a standardization and education that exposes young people and mandates that some of these teams, team sports, um, do some career and academic exposure, that we have scholar athletes. For the mentorship piece, um, I have the privilege of working with the nonprofit Mentoring in Medicine and Science. We've served about 2,500 students in the Bay Area to expose them to health careers, what we're talking about today. And the young people, we start in middle school, we work with high school students and college students as well. The theme is, I don't have anyone in my family who's in that career. I haven't been exposed to the career, I just don't know how to get in the career. You all know that our beautiful black children are brilliant smart, self-resilient, motivated, but it just takes one knock, and often the knock comes if they make it to college. When they take that first chemistry class or that first biochem or organic chemistry class, um, and they also took a biology class and a physics because some fool told them that it was okay to take three sciences in your first semester as a freshman year, uh, and then they fall off. They think medicine is not for me. But it's not that, you just weren't advised properly and you didn't have the right mentorship. And my plea to this audience is the mentor does not have to be a physician. What they need is hope, motivation, confidence, common sense, and any of us can do that. I love one of our legislators, our congresswomen at the luncheon said she missed uh, the mentoring initiative that she helped start 25 years ago where they mentored 5,000 uh, young people children in Florida, and we need that period. We need that in our middle schools, in our high schools, and on the college level. And as a people, it's not happening. Um, when I said that I interview in my emergency medicine residency program, it, it is wonderful. I get excited when I see African American medical students. Um, and I always do a beta test. I, I assess, well, what's your history? Are you first generation? Where are you from? And the landscape is changing. We love the diaspora of African people. Um, but I would like to see more data to show what do the African American medical African students look like because they're Afro-Caribbean, they're African now. And we want exposure to all, but the African American students are decreasing. The black American students are decreasing. Um, and the first
first generation students are decreasing was the final point I was going to make on that. Um, they say my mother was a nurse or my father was an ophthalmologist or my aunt was a physician assistant or my uncle was a judge and his wife was a nurse. So they're not the first generation, first to make it to college, first in their families. Um, they are us in this room. And I love you, but I love the rest of our people too. And if we're going to expand this, we have to do more to address the disparity in our educational system. And we have to get comfortable serving others, not ourselves, so we can reach more and make a larger impact. I, I'm going to stop there because I think you just said five minutes. I have three more M's, which I'm sure will come up in the discussion. Why don't you just say what the M's are? The M's are money. Their financial barriers. Middle school was the other M, and the last M was medical school expansion. Our um, deans here, Howard, Morehouse, and Meharry, continue to um, pump out the largest number of black doctors, period. And if there are other HBCUs that could get the resources and sustainability to create um, medical schools, I think that would also make an impact for if the three here could expand. They are doing the best and still producing the most black doctors, period. Um, and we need more of that. Thank you. So with the resources, thank you very much. I think she's raised some points that I'm hoping we will hear discussion back from the audience once we get through our other speakers. But to be fair, we want to hear from each of our speakers first. So we next have uh, Dr. Veronica Mallet, who is the dean at Meharry Medical College. And we are so pleased that you are here and able to join. So I'll turn the mic over to you. And try to keep it to about five minutes. And I will do my best. It's hard. There's so much to say. Well, there, there is uh, much to say, but Dr. Garrett said a lot. And as I was sitting here reflecting, I realized that um, my oldest daughter helped to reflect much of what has been my experience around this issue. She is a school social work student. And what she shared with me, as most of her work is on the south side of Chicago, is that she said, you know, she worked in elementary school. And she says, Mom, they start criminalizing these black boys in second grade. They, they, start, they start treating them differently. I see it, it breaks my heart, but I, I, I challenge these teachers all the time that their behavior is the behavior of boys. It's not the behavior in any different than, than what you would see in a white boy. It's, it's, it's typical male behavior, but they start making it criminal behavior. And I think that it is that uh, place where we have to start in elementary school and early elementary school with that mentoring piece in order to make a difference. Our pipeline programs have to be from first grade if we are to follow those black males into, into a health career. And we have to open all health careers in order to make a difference in our workforce expansion. Everybody doesn't have to be a physician and uh, we at Meharry are doing some initiatives with workforce expansion in Sub-Saharan Africa. And through that initiative, I realized we could do some of those things, same things for, for workforce expansion in the U.S. But so much of why we have this problem is our history. It's pure ED racism. It's why there is this whole difference in education. It's what's happening in America today. And that is what we have to put our energy to overcome. As our uh, House of Representatives uh, Congressperson said, we need to act now to fight the, the money grab that's taking place first so that we have a, an opportunity to do this workforce expansion that's needed. I'm gonna stop my comments there. I'm going to just ask you to add, because you were talking about perhaps expanding the program, I'm going to give each of you one little person at the end. Where do you think we should be seeking those additional resources to expand the kind of program you're describing? 
Well, at Meharry, we're planning to add a PA school. We're going through the accrediting proce uh, process and we're hoping to see our first class in 2019. And our uh, strategic plan um, we have a 10-year strategic plan because under our president, Dr. James Hildreth, we have in the back. Dr. Hildreth has put forth a bold vision for our sesquicentennial. Sesquicentennial, I had to practice saying that. Word. <laughs> Harry has been in existence for 150 years. We're, we're one of the oldest medical schools in the United States. We're, the, in, the other schools should be learning from us how to educate medical students, period. And our success, in, in order for us to be here for another 150 years, we have a bold vision for 2026. And in that vision, we plan to double our class size in the next 10 years. Now, that is a bold vision from Harry, because we are not a, a, a resource-rich institution. But with your help, with uh, the support of the community, and with our new curriculum that we're putting forth, we think that we will have the opportunity to do that. And we're, ex we're putting strategic plans in place to execute that vision. And we're driven to do that because we are here today watching our numbers shrink. And we understand for the health of our community that we are obligated to do that. We are passionately driven towards that goal because we feel a responsibility to address a need that is not being addressed. And that's why our, our, we work every day to address that goal. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we can come back and discuss that a little bit more, but that's wonderful to hear about that vision uh, and the expansion and the new program. I'm now going to turn to Dr. Hugh Mike, who came to Howard in 2015. Um, now he's been there almost three years, I guess. And he is uh, not only the dean of the College of Medicine, but also vice president of clinical affairs. So I'm sure you have some great perspectives to offer us. So Dr. Mighty, please, please take the mic. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll shift gears just a little bit. I greet my colleagues about pipelines. We've been focused a long time on pipelines. Howard has several pipeline programs beginning in the middle school, which we have a STEM program in middle school, et cetera. We have multiple programs of college students. And, and so I think we're starting to move forward with pipelines. There's a lot of work with the medical schools, the HBCU medical schools, by Harry Morehouse, Howard, and Drew, to include and bring in the other HBCUs in the process of trying to produce medical doctors. And this year, for the first time that I know of at Howard, we had 11 HBCU colleges represented which is the largest number we've had in the career that I can think of at Howard. So I think we're starting to make some dents in that process. However, one of the things that I look for is, I look at the access issues, and I'll say two things about access. First is we can produce many more doctors and we can double the size of medical schools and we can do everything else, but you're not really a member of the practice and the community and you're not able to deliver care unless you get to a residency program and someone certifies you. We're not creating more residency slots. And as those residency slots get more competitive, the question is who will get those slots? Um, this past year, roughly 600 students, graduating students from fourth year of American colleges did not have residency slots to get. So as we look at access, we must be able to increase the number of things that will drive that. Now that's a little bit in CMS's lab because they sponsor residency programs. So funding from that end is going to be just as important because we'll produce a lot of people who then won't really have jobs, which is hard to think about when you think physicians don't have jobs. But that is a crisis that I think is coming and we're going to have to figure out how to do it. The second thing that we focus on at Howard, we have the only dental school in the District of Columbia, the only pharmacy school in the District of Columbia. We have a school of allied health nursing. We have a master's program in, in um, social work and we have, of course, a medical school as well. We have all the components for what I think really drives access to care. And it's not medicine, as in physicians, that I think will ultimately drive access to care. I think we have to start with case managers, nurses, 
you know, ancillary people who will get into communities. We, we, the access to care issue, for example, in Washington, D.C. is to get to Howard University, if you live on the east of the river in D.C., you need buses, you need subways. It's not easy to get to your care. And so we, our ability to take and develop interprofessional practices, which involve teams of providers, not just the medical doctors, going to be vitally important as to how we deliver access to care to be able to do what we want to do in the terms we throw around a lot, such as population health and so forth. So I, I believe that's going to be a critical thing that we do. Thank you. Thank you for, in fact, I was hoping you would address some of the clinical issues. And I want to keep in mind when we talk about resources, I just heard Daryl Kirch speak a few days ago about the problem of GM and graduate uh, education positions. And, and that is really something that Congress needs to be giving attention to to raise the gap on funds that are available for graduate medical education positions. So while they're fighting for it, let me not be political here, but I think they're, it just means we need to keep in mind that there's so many, there are so many things that Congress determines that affect ultimate things that you don't always think about. I'm going to talk about the ACA and other aspects of health and women's health and minority health if, if someone else doesn't. Uh, when we finish this panel, because I'm not sure everybody even recognizes all the things that will go away with the repeal of the ACA, but that's not for me to talk about now, because I'm going to move to our next speaker, who is Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, who is the sixth president of Morehouse School of Medicine, the first woman to lead the freestanding institution, and uh, what can I say, Valerie is a fantastic woman, did so much to help us at NIH on career issues and, and research issues related to women's health, because she is a researcher also. So, Dr. Montgomery Rice. Slight increase in the applicant pool, but 
you don't see in this red bar a real increase in the number of black kids going to medical school. But you see this significant decline from 28% to 15%, from 24% to 10%. And you ask the questions as anyone would say, what if we had kept the rate of the applicants at 28% or the rate of the, uh, the matriculants at 24%? we would have 9,969 more black physicians in this country. So don't try to boil the whole ocean. Let's just focus on HBCU undergraduate schools. And so my colleagues and I, Dr. Hildreth and I led this discussion. Dr. Frederick came on board. Our colleague, Dr. Carlio at Drew came on board. And we host a conference called Empower. And it is solely focused on increasing the competitiveness of the applicants coming from undergraduate HBCU schools. And so we need for you all to please work with us to mentor those students at those undergraduate schools that we still believe have significant value so that they are prepared and competitive to be a part of this applicant pool. And if we just focused on that, we would have a significant number, a significant increase in the number. Now, it is true that our four schools cannot take all the applicants. And Morehouse School of Medicine, when I was got there five years ago, our class size was 56. This year, we enrolled 100 MD students. <laughs> program was started in 2019. Howard has a significant number of students in their class. Drew hopefully will move to be a four-year school. However, at the end of the day, you all, we cannot do it. We cannot allow the other 146 medical schools to believe that they don't have a responsibility to increase in the diversity of their school, of their class size. And so we have to continue to hold them accountable not feel that we have to take on the whole experience or be responsible for the whole experience. And so I hope that we're going to have a discussion, further discussion about what are the barriers to our students' experience when they go to the other schools. Because we have great success and it takes additional resources for us to do that. So two things, increase the number coming from our undergraduate schools, increase in their competitiveness and understanding the environment in which these, school, these students need to function in, regardless of what institution they're at, so that they can be successful. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to hear about these new programs as well as expansions um, and these suggestions, because I really do want to hear from you what you think are innovative and potentially or proven successful strategies Valerie knows those are terms I'd love to use. Innovative and successful strategies that can be implemented to make a difference. But I want to remind the audience that, you know, we've got mostly those involved in healthcare and, and physicians here. But, you know, we are bringing up issues related to education. We're bringing up issues related to society and sociocultural issues. We're bringing up issues related to financial issues. And we haven't really gotten into ethics, and I know we have several ethicists in the audience. So hopefully when we get in a few minutes to audience comments, we'll get some comments related to the ethics of the whole situation of access to health care, access to health care education, uh, and some perspectives from members from the audience or from the panel. Um, I want to just turn back again to the panel and ask you briefly, not everyone to address this unless everyone has a strong comment, but you have mentioned and you've already mentioned some things that you are doing uh, that might help to bring about an increase in our African-American young people. You've mentioned mentoring, you've mentioned education programs, dealing with K-12, dealing with early education programs. We haven't really mentioned role modeling. I think we, we, we used to always talk about role models and mentors. You've mentioned mentoring. But let me just ask, I'm going to ask each of you, give me what you think is the one most important thing that links could promote, or we as individuals, even if we are, are not links in this room, could promote 
that you think might really make a difference in the number of young people, male and female, who might really decide they want to go into healthcare, be it a physician, be it a dentist, a pharmacist, LFLPA or whatever. What do you think would be, and you, I'm going to start with you, uh, Jocelyn, because you do mentoring. What is your major gimmick that you use that all of us can take with us to know when we're addressing young people, how do we get them to start on that pathway? They just need to know <laughs> Dr. Penn. Um, and as Dr. Mighty said, it's not just um, health. Everything's about the team now. And frankly, everyone isn't going to be a physician. And everyone doesn't necessarily need a physician. You can have a nurse practitioner, a physician mm -hmm. assistant, health coach, health navigator. Uh, when we speak to young people, we have a program that works with um, African-American boys in the ninth grade, trying to get them into a health academy in one of the Oakland Unified School District competitive um, programs. And uh, they have no clue what a respiratory therapist is, a nuclear medical tech. They don't know what's required to go into occupational therapy or physical therapy. So if the links, we all, uh, um, programming is at the heart of link though. And if we can incorporate health career exposure into the young people we serve, I do think that would, would help. I must say that I didn't know what a pathologist was. And nobody, my father certainly never thought I was going to be a pathologist. Said, How could you do that? You're scared of funeral homes and cemeteries. <laughs> so it's exposure and getting to know. Once I saw what pathology was, I didn't grow up saying I wanted to be a pathologist. So I think you're right that having students know, know they can but having them exposed to what to so many different opportunities. So we need to do more of that. Valerie? I don't mean to go, yeah, Scott, we'll skip down to the end of the table. Valerie, Dr. Montgomery Rice. So I didn't mean to go with first names, but that's okay. I'm the old mother up here, so it's a like, call me whatever you like, Dr. Pan. It's kind of not answer. I believe that, and, and I, I have my president here with us, I believe that every link chapter should adopt an elementary student yep. and should partner, and I'm going to tell you why. If you look at fourth grade reading proficiency, is 26% for African American males, whereas it's 49% for white males. And it worsens when you get low income families, it goes down to 10% for African American males and compared to 25% for white males. And the reason you all that reading is so important is that it is the one thing that you must have to be a critical thinker. Yes. And the reason that our students don't end up doing well on standardized tests is because of critical thinking and reading. We've shown it over and over again. So if we want to get the biggest bang for our butt. We need to adopt a K through five school, and our goal needs to be to increase the reading proficiency of every one of one of those students to 80 percent we do that a lot of the other stuff will start to work out on its own people can do math better when they can read but you can't understand a math problem if you can't read it
coaches, and I think you mentioned about coaches, uh, programs in different areas around the country where coaches who, you know, all, well I should say all, but so many young boys think about sports and they have their heroes, but where those in the healthcare community are getting coaches to, to also serve as mentors for careers in health care. Care. So they come, they learn how to play basketball, but then they also have to show their selling and their sciences and just getting, looking at every way to get, but why not combine the sciences with other careers and maybe not just in medicine, other aspects, law or other things that we can think about, but capture their identity because not every young boy is going to be a Michael Jordan or a, a I'm trying to call the sports names, I won't give up. <laughs> Veronica, I'm going to turn to you before I embarrass myself <laughs> further. <laughs> well, I, um, I think when I've been to, to the uh, national meetings, I've always been awed by the award winners and the amazing work that they are doing in the community. I think LinkedIn is an example of the many things that can be done. I, I love Valerie's idea of adopting a, an elementary school because reading does uh, instill critical thinking. But uh, some of our link chapters and the one that, that I'm transferring from in El Paso, we had a STEM academy that was focused on our middle school and the whole idea was to create a love of science. And it, it, the, the idea that science can be fun and you look forward to it and it's hands-on and interactive and you come away with joy and smiles, that's, that's what you want. The other piece I think that there is the, if we focus on the African American male, um, is the um, opportunity to teach what it is to, uh, uh, or what is masculinity? That it is masculine to excel, it is masculine to respect women, it is masculine to, um, to uh, be a good student, to uh, do all of the things that will lead to a successful life. And I think for boys, it does have to be men who teach those lessons. And, and so I think links have to partner with the strong men to help teach boys those lessons, especially since many times they're not men in, in, uh, available to create that exposure. And if we could do that as links, that would be an opportunity for us. In setting national examples, but I'll be quiet and I will now turn to the audience <laughs> because I think this gives us a good start and rather than just questions coming from me, I'd like to go to the audience. I'm going to ask because we've got a room full of experts and I'm sure a room full of many opinions and I'd like to get as many as I can. So I ask that you keep your questions or your comments. We welcome comments also, questions or comments free. But please identify yourself so everyone will know who's at the mic when you speak. Yes. Thank you. I'm John Celia. I'm an osteopathic physician, a cardiothoracic surgeon. But right now, I am also the DIO at the DME of a training program which talks about uh, the access to residencies for uh, African American uh, students. And I, I really want to talk about a couple of things. One is you've got to deprogram. You've got to deprogram the society and also kids to say that they can succeed. And I think the one thing that's very important as we look at this whole process is African American men get bumped or hit all the way through from the time they're in the sixth grade all the way through the residency program. I can't tell you how many people that are very, very smart but got bumped some way during their training program. I think that the profession, for instance, is the fastest growing profession. One out of every five medical students is an osteopathic student. So do you really know that? Does people know that often? often? So I think it's very important to do that. The second thing is that, is that as we deprogram these individuals, I think it's very important to understand. They say, well, let's lower the standard. I say, many times our kids don't know what the standards are. Do you know that in order to get into a, I, I'm a professor at Michigan State University. 
how you ask that. In order to get to Michigan State, you need a 3.7 and 3.8. Let's program that into our kids early on. Let's let them know. Because I go to, when I go to mentoring sessions, I don't call kids many times by their name. I say, what's your grade point average? Because you've got to talk to people in the kind of language that they understand. I'm here this year, this week, advocating the teaching health centers, which is 730 residency slots that are placed in the community. These programs are owned by the community, so the community, the community can tell you who to choose. And so many of us don't know that the teaching health center programs are your programs. You can go to those programs, be board members of those, of those organizations, and actually talk to them. At this time, in my residency program, 20% of my students are African American. I didn't say minority because that, that name minority has changed so often. Yes. Minority does not mean African American. Yes. So I just want to let you know that. But you know, I have a lot of comments and there's a lot of because I mentor African American men. And you don't really understand what society does to you. And, and no matter where you come from. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I have a lot of I said a lot of us have boys, so we do know. Yeah. So we do know. I'm just saying that, but you, you know, the, so I'm saying that you've got to surround them all along the way. Because let me tell you something, when I see a kid that comes to my program that really has not done the board so well, you understand what I'm talking about, or they may be from the Harry or from some other schools, but we do take both Alabama and the hospital positions they do, you've got to put your arms around them. And as soon as you do that, their whole outlook changes. Because anybody, when they start, are very, very smart. Thank right, you, Dr. Go Seeley, go. for raising that. Yes. The next speaker comes. I just wanted to respond to the two themes that I heard. The African-American boys will get bumped uh, even now. Right? I think all the men know that they still deal with isolation and bumps. Um, I think that could be mitigated if more of us are serving as mentors and hold positions of power. It comes down to us having a seat at the table. Um, as a faculty member at my department, every single year, the one or two black men in my program um, have struggles. Often it is subjective because in residency, you don't take tests. You're graded based off of your interaction with the physician of record. That's subjective. That could be cultural, relationship building. Uh, so it, it takes us to be at the table when they're getting the evaluations to mitigate that and slide in. Um, as well, I wanted to challenge what you were saying about they need to know they have to have a 3.7 GPA. Um, I, I think that we need to change, consider changing what do you consider competitive. They, our experts here mentioned there are 146 other medical schools. I have had several students matriculate successfully to Howard, Meharry, and Morehouse with a 3.3 science GPA and a 28 on the MCAT. And other schools won't even consider you if you don't have a 30 on the MCAT and a 3.7 GPA. And all of those students have graduated successfully and matriculated into a residency program. We need to be at the table to change knowing that it's not a level playing field in our educational system, but they can get up to the level if they get the opportunity. So again, it's power in being at the table. Um, I'm going to keep my comment briefly, but brief, but I, I have to step in here and make a comment. And we're going to move because we've got a long line. I'm going to ask each of you to keep your comments brief and our responses brief, but I'm glad everybody's excited about this. But I was going to raise this earlier when we talk about being competitive and being qualified. I ran a minority recruitment program back in, starting in 1970 in Boston, and fought the same things you're fighting today. And I had an extremely, one of the most successful minority recruitment programs because they allowed me to exercise my young and militant voice then, but saying, we don't have to just have the top student in the college coming in. What are the criteria that are important? This was pre bobby before the focus on GPA, uh, and before the focus on just using data. I can remember someone who went on to be a leading cancer researcher. I interviewed him. His grades had fallen down. I won't say what in one of our HBCUs, but I looked, 
I knew he was smart, but his junior year, his grades had really hit the bottom. And then he came back up, and I said, what happened? Were you pledging fraternity that year? Yes, he was. But I had some confidence. And in fact, I just saw a bunch of my former students from those early days, as we're now talking about 30, 40 years later. And he remembered that because he, 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 that was why he came to my program. He thought somebody understands why my grades fell and knew what a fraternity pledging was. And he ended up being one of my top students, finishing AOA out of the school. We look at and, and seeing students that come in, not everybody needs to have, as I think you're saying, but I'm concerned about referring to people just on the basic GPA. They need to look at potential, what they're coming from, what they're dealing with when they get there, and offering support. And I, I, I just have seen so many not fall in the trap that so many of the court students have brought about and others. Yes, we want to make sure it's important. You gotta be able to pass boards. So you gotta be able to take a standardized test. But let's don't let's let's exercise some of our understanding of the social cultural aspects yeah. that our students are putting up with so we don't keep them out. I'm sorry, that's my sermon for the day. Let's go to the next response. That was a great sermon. <laughs> I'm Mary Mitchell. I'm the executive director for the Manhattan Staten Island Area Health Education Center in the village of Harlem in New York. Uh, and I'm here representing the National AHEC organization, uh, whose role it is to focus on increasing diversity and the distribution of health professionals across this country. Diversity and distribution means a lot to us, having to do with the distribution of not only in, in minority areas, but also when we look at rural areas. We have to remember that there were rural areas full of black African American people who also need these opportunities. We look at um, doing pipeline programs, and I have to get back to what Dr. Garrett started talking about. We must in encourage, insist that uh, government supports pipeline programs. The mandate right now from the HRSA, which funds, um, uh, which funds AHEC and other programs like AHEC, is to do pipeline programming from the collegiate level and on and above. They expect that they're going to increase diversity uh, by working at the collegiate level. Well, the people jump up and be born, and they're in college, and they now can, it doesn't work that way. And they are saying to us, not that you cannot do pipeline programs beneath that level, but you can't use our money to do it. And that's a very serious message. And we need to be sure that not only the government supports this and that the reauthorization happens for AHEC, but for other kinds of pipeline programs, HCOP, uh, Steps of Excellence, I'm sure many of you in this room know about these programs that need to be supported. We believe, we know, I see kids every day. If they can't see it, they can't be it. Exposure is so critical. If I have seen students come to me and say they want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. Little black boys, little black girls want to be midwives and all sorts of things. And what we do is expose them to the healthcare delivery system and help them find their way in that. And it's fine if they want to be that, third, that uh, surgeon or whatever else they might want to do, but there are many students that once they f find out what social work is all about mm -hmm. and what psychology is all about, mm -hmm. and they go and see, they take a trip to the NYU School of Dentistry, or they go to the SUNY School of Optometry, mm -hmm. and they, they get, begin to play with the gadgets and learn what all they can do. They are exposed, their eye. you can see it happening in front of your face. I've seen this happen. We have to continue to promote pipeline programs. It's just absolutely critical. Um, the other point I just want to make is um, uh, about the reaching African American students. We see this a lot, and I see this particularly in Harlem. We have tons of African students. I have no problem with my African brothers and sisters. I'm concerned about them as well. But their their entree, their mission is different. They fill out an application for us, and we ask why are they interested? Why do they want to do this? They say because my parents expect me to. They have an expectation. They, that's, that is their narrative. It is different from the African-American student who was raised in the projects. It is a very different mission, and it's a different narrative. But we need to understand that if we want to focus on African-American students. Um, and last comment. The last comment is that if, in order, if we increase diversity, then we improve health care. We improve health care, then we will have better health outcomes. We have to increase diversity. Thank, Thank you. you for that. I want to just say one thing. Since I'm no longer in government, I'm retired. That I didn't make comments when I was in government. But, um, the, 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 and just something to be aware of that there used to be programs and funding within HHS 
that would go back for, I mean, I remember when I had a science, uh, developed a science curriculum for elementary schools out of NIH that we put into place. But during the past, now I've been retired for six years, I know it hasn't changed, but, but uh, before I even retired, there came, you know, there are different ways, different theories in government about how to, to do things, especially when it comes to funding. And the funding of early education programs was thought to belong to the Department of Education yes. Yes. and not to HHS. Yes. So while HRSA, even NIH, and other uh, agencies within HHS used to be able to fund or used to do quite a bit of funding, that really became, uh, I won't say, well, let's say encouraged, I don't know whether it was prohibited, but, but I know that a number of those programs were dropped with the idea that the Department of Education should be picking up those issues. There's a disconnect there, and I think what you said is really important. I was not happy about it, but it wasn't my decision to make, but, but I think if we are aware of it outside of government, sometimes you don't pay attention to these things, understand what's happening. You can talk to your Congress people, and you can talk to your legislators, and you can keep your eye on what's happening and raise it in the appropriate, appropriate forum, like now. So yes, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here. And I am probably very different than everyone here. I am boots on the ground. My name is Vanessa Sparks. I'm from Queens, New York. I am a former PTA president. I am a former school board member. I am a past vice president of an education council. And I was the first PTA president of Queens Gateway to help science in secondary school in 1994. Oh help get a $40 million school building bill for mostly black students. Now, I, want, I thought at the very beginning, the question was, what can the links do to help? So let me just give you, I'm only speaking in terms of New York City. For the past 22 years, I personally take 11th and 12th grade students to the AAMC conference every year there in the Northeast. I don't ask anybody's permission. I don't ask for anybody's money other than people that I know. $10 here, $20 there, and take students. One of the things in terms of exposure you can do is something as small as that. Boots on the ground because they are going to reach students that you're not going to see every day. Partner with, officially or unofficially, informally or formally, those boots on the ground organizations because they're going to find all the students that you're not going to find. Also, and I used to work at Down, I worked at Down State Medical School in the student admissions office for 10 years. And I asked then, the first year I was there, I said, why are 5,000 people applying and there are only 325 black applicants in Brooklyn? And I was told because you start, you start preparing for medical school in middle school. You have to have a relationship with those middle schools. What I do also is I work with families. Because sometimes the biggest hindrance for students is not the student it's himself or herself, it's the family. They consciously or unconsciously sabotage the career or future careers of their children. They may not take that, listen, you fall back and let these people help your child for you, but they take it from me. And that's true not just for our young boys, but our young girls too. Yes. yes. So, uh, I've been told because, and I love what you're saying, and I'd love to get a discussion about Dale State, but I've been, been uh, alerted that we have so many questions. From and this is just real quick to uh, let me finish and I'll let you finish right, your comments and interrupt you. But I have been, been advised that one it would be in our best interest of the audience if we limit the questions or comments one to two minutes, and I guess that applies to me also. Um, okay. Uh, this so goes to something Dr. Rice said about the, the HBCUs. Part of the issue is, at least in New York City, students and very bright black students are not encouraged to go to HBCUs. My cousin is a physician, went to Spelman undergrad, went, came from Bronx High School of Science and was told by her guidance counsel, why do you want to go to that school? And I can get you into Harvard or Yale. Again, Building relationships with boots on the ground because you're not going to see those kids. But people like me, we work with them and we can get them to you ready. Thank you. That's a uh, Okay, so now I've, I've got a time in here because I don't see so awful. And she's going to put her hand up in there. One, one hand. Right there. Yes, Val, please do. So, uh, yes, we can. First of all, as you know, as our children have more diverse experiences. 
they're going to want to go to a lot of different schools. Okay? The, the, there has not been a decrease in enrollment of HBCUs. There are lots of kids still at HBCUs. What we have to do at our HBCU undergraduate schools, and be very clear with this about this, we have to improve the curriculum so that the students who are graduating are more competitive. That's the challenge with the undergraduate HBCU students. When we look at the science and the curriculum there, it is not preparing the kids to be successful on these standardized tests. And you all, we have the data. We know all of the MCAT scores from all of the HBCUs compared to other students from the same neighborhoods, et cetera, who went to a majority school. We have the data. And so it is not necessarily what the student who's going in per se always, it is what happens in that environment. And we right. need to be a partner with the HBCU undergraduate schools that may be resource, uh, have a challenge with resources by providing more resources to them, giving money back to our alma maters, and then insisting that the curriculum is strengthened such that whatever kid, whatever kid goes to an HBCU undergraduate school, they come out competitive to go into whatever field they desire. To be successful. Next person is about to thank Good you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I can't express to you how honored it is to look around this room and see all of these faces. It's awesome. You guys should stand right here to see what I'm talking about. Um, my name is Keisha Robinson. I'm a family medicine physician here practicing in the District of Columbia. Most of my practice, of course, is in Ward 7 and 8. And if you know anything about Ward 7 and 8, then we serve the underserved. And I work for um, one of the largest um, uh, community health centers in the District of Columbia. Um, the reason why I'm here is because, thankfully, because I literally left what I do to um, be a guest with Adrian White, who is actually the CEO, um, president of the AOA. So I'm very honored. So I am an osteopathic physician. Um, yes, I'm an alumni of Hampton University. From there, I went to New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, and it just listened to everyone and brought me back to what my class looked like. So I spent definitely, I've been practicing for 13 years, and I'm on the front line. I cannot tell you, I started in Ward 8, now I'm in Ward 7. I cannot tell you how many of my African American kids are not graduating from high school. Who are, and, I actually told them, I would do a cartwheel if I hear that you applied to undergraduate. It is a, it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. I know our patient and our culture, they're trying not to repeat the cycle. But I see over 13 years, they're repeating the cycle. And there are those who are doing better than their parents, but they are struggling. And everyone in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. So what I did for the last five years, so I'm a homegrown um, applicant. I'm part of the pipeline. Before the pipeline was ever initiated, one more minute. Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. <laughs> I'm on board eight. So actually practicing in that section. Okay. So now I mentor medical students who are going to osteopathic medical students who are new physicians, and we are not getting interviews. So last five seconds. I would like to see, and I challenge every single medical school to have a curriculum whether you call it mentorship, requirement of medical students, undergraduate medical students, go into the middle schools, go into the high school, is a curriculum requirement in order for them to get a grade. There you go, you have the exposure. But do we have the funding? No, we do not. So I like the idea of links going in. I do, but we need more, and we have more. We have a program where we're in the school-based health centers, but I just, yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you for what you're doing. No, we actually do have the funding. It's just it's in our pockets. So I just have to tell everybody now. Look, it's whether you buy one less pair of shoes or one less St. John outfit or whatever. That is, that. you know, we keep expecting the government. And I'm just talking about our shoes. It really comes down to our priorities and whether we give back. If we were to ask how many of us 
went to an HBCU, and if you've given your alma mater $10,000 this year, I don't know how many hands we would have go up. I don't think it would be a lot. Okay, and so that's where it is, you know, it really comes down to us prioritizing. We have, the money is in our community, we just have to prioritize it differently. Thank you for that comment. Very Good afternoon, my Ling sisters and honorable mention. I will confess that I chose not to be a physician because my father is a neuroradiologist, product of Howard Med, and he went on to be on the faculty of Stanford Med and then private practice in Connecticut. So we talk the brain a lot. I would posit to the panel today, based off of the recent science that is coming out, um, MRI advances in technology out of Stanford Med, Dr. Sapolsky, and out of Mass General, that we know the answer to intervening and creating this pipeline is zero to three. So elementary school is too late. Language acquisition and facility with the language, first, second, third languages, is zero to three. So that ability to speak English, that ability to have a broad vocabulary and that intellectual scientific curiosity is zero to three. And we know that from the science, but we also know it, I have a petri dish of my public transportation every morning to work. I see white parents with their babies in strollers, reading to them, engaging with them, talking to them, playing with them. And I see black parents on their phones, yelling and screaming. I've heard one say, shut the fuck up or I will punch you in the throat. I've seen that on my bus. And that happens every day. The parenting, the zero to three. So is the role then for physician education and maternity? Is it with our, with our zero to three medical intervention? What, what is it that we as Link Sisters can do with zero to three? We do a lot in elementary and middle school. We do a lot with the college pipeline, but zero to three is where that language comes. I also think that, and I was gonna say this earlier, but I, I think it's also, the, the parenting has to do with social justice as well. So, how many jobs does that woman have? The one who's gonna punch her baby in the throat. You know, how many stressors does she have at home? What, what kind of methylation has attached to her gene, to, to her DNA? What kind of epigenetics have already altered her gene generations ago that she inherited from her, the physical trauma that she already experienced generations ago because her mother was raped? When, when, and, and so this is an inherited injustice that we're trying to overcome. So, so yeah, we can intervene at, at, in, with parenting classes and we can get books in the house and we can try to teach parents to talk to their children. But, but we also, we have to attack this from, from multiple areas because it, it, it is and does boil down to our inherited shame in this nation. And that is how we all got here. And, and so I think that, yes, you're right. But if you're going to invoke science, then we have to look at the broader picture of the, our inherited trauma and that how that is Good afternoon, Lynn Sisters. Jennifer Dorn, American Valley, New Jersey chapter, and that's a very excellent.